Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the measure and nature of delinquency. So again, we're going to be looking at both quantitative research and qualitative research to how we can go out and study social phenomena such as juvenile delinquency. Um, when we're talking about quantitative data, we're looking at things like numerical statistics, probabilities, um, likelihoods, frequencies, you know, um, differences between groups. And then when we're looking at qualitative research, we can go out and ask people open-ended questions and get their opinions, you know, for example. We can um, have focus groups and talk to community members. We can talk to police and see what they're really seeing on the streets, you know. Is crime going up or down? Is it more violent than it used to be? Is it less, you know? And again, when we delve into the quantitative and qualitative research, there is so much that you can study. So in this chapter, I'll just introduce a few things that you know, I pulled up, um, you know, from some of the government uh, statistic gathering um, mechanisms. And so I've got some of that in here um, and I'll introduce you to it. But again, it's good to know where the resources are. So again, if you're looking for things like frequencies, the FBI, the Office of Juvenile Justice, there's a lot of places you can get really good statistical data. So I highly recommend that, but that's not the only source of gathering data. So this chapter just kind of delves into the research methods behind how that we approach studying juvenile delinquency. Um, I'll put up some supplemental research methods videos for you guys in case you're interested in going deeper into different types of quantitative and qualitative analysis. But for the purpose of this class, we're just going to be looking at how do we go out and get at this secondary data to use that to prove points, to ask questions like, is crime increasing or decreasing for juveniles? Uh, at what age are juveniles most likely to commit crimes, for example? Uh, how often is the same juvenile committing crimes, for example? Um, you know, what types of crimes are they committing? And so we can look into all kinds of different stuff for this. Um, but again, quantitative statistics doesn't always tell us why people are going out and committing crimes. And so again, that's where it can be more complicated because even though we have the numbers that say this many crimes occur, that doesn't always tell us why people are out there committing crimes. And so a sociological approach is going to have to think about things like the social context. What's going on in the social context that's associated with causes or reasons for people committing crimes, okay? Is it poverty, age, gender, exposure to things in the social context that are labeled as deviant? Or is it something psychological? Is it something going on in people's brains? But is it the thinking that's going on in their head, you know, that's associated with experiences they might have had in the social context, for example? And so again, in this class, we're always thinking that biopsychosocial approach. We're looking at, you know, those biological motivations for, you know, why are they going out and engaging those types of behaviors? What's going on in their mind? How are they thinking? Cognition? How are they feeling? What are their internal motivations? And then the external social context. What are they exposed to? What kind of environment are they living in? Do they have role models? Are they exposed to high quality people? Or are they exposed to people that engage in crime? And so it can be very complicated, you know, and you want to say like, yeah, maybe poverty is the cause, but it turns out kids in poverty commit pretty much just as many crimes as kids in, you know, that are not in poverty. But there's a little bit of disparity in the types of crimes, you know, between lower classes and middle and upper classes, for example. But again, there's no one answer. Like you can't just say it's because they're in poverty. That just doesn't account for it. Or it's because they're male. Women don't commit crimes because that's insufficient. We need to be thinking about all of these factors. And then we need to address how do we measure all of these factors? Like how do we measure whether social class is associated with committing crimes? Well, we could do that by measuring the socioeconomic status of the parents of people that are being arrested but are police targeting people in lower class neighborhoods more than they are in middle and upper class neighborhoods? And again, it's, it's very complex. And things like lawyers are a factor. There's a chart coming up in a little bit that talks about how we get processed in the criminal justice system and how many of those that get arrested actually get found guilty and sentenced, you know, and then is having a lawyer associated with that. And and so are the sentencing rates higher for lower class people than they are for upper class people because an upper class person can afford a lawyer and can get out of trouble easier? And so 
with sociology, the beauty of it is it's so complex. There are so many little dots that we have to connect. So that's the sociological approach. Thinking about all of the diverse factors that play into these social phenomena, like people committing crimes in the social context that are under the age of 18 or under the age of 17, depending upon the state that you live in. So let's delve into it a little bit. So when it comes to crime reporting, um, your book is going to focus on a couple of highlights. These are some good, solid, government-supported, hopefully peer-reviewed to the extent that you know a scholarly journal would peer-review kind of crime statistics. Um, so you have the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, the UCR. Again, this is the FBI, the police, the state police. This is all of your local governments and your state level governments and your federal governments are all uh, reporting their activities, arrests, prosecutions, et cetera, to the Uniform Crime Reporting Program. Um, and so here, if you look at like FBI.gov, for example, they have so many statistics on there for all the crimes that occur in the United States and things like that. And so we have all these diverse ways of reporting the crimes. Um, when it comes to juvenile court statistics, I like the one that's on the next page, which is, um, it's actually the, over here, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which is down here. I'll talk about that for a second. But for example, I absolutely love that website whenever I'm studying, uh, you know, working with students in this class, for example, on final projects or whatever it might be, because uh, that has data that's specific to uh, younger cohorts, again, juveniles. The uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Program that, you know, involves FBI, police and all of that, you're going to have all of a crime. You're gonna, it's a little bit more to sift through at times. Um, so the OJJ uh, DP, they're really good for looking at the juvenile court statistics. They're looking at arrest, processing, how far does it go, does it go all the way to sentencing, how long are they sentencing, and then all the demographic and data that's associated with that. And so some really good areas to gather up data. Again, the purpose of this chapter is to talk about how do we gather up data to be able to answer the questions of is race or biological sex or crime or previously having used substances associated with whether or not a juvenile is going to commit crimes, for example. So these are really good areas to get that statistical data. But the book is also going to talk about things like cohort studies, comparing groups over time, victimization reports. Um, reporting that they've experienced some form of crime, even if that person wasn't arrested. That's another way of measuring it. Uh, prevalence of delinquency. How often is this occurring um, within different cohorts? And then incidence of delinquency, which is just overall number of events. And so again, I talked about quantitative and qualitative data. So again, a lot of that quantitative data is going to be your uniform crime reporting program. It's just all numbers, statistics about all kinds of factors. Juvenile court statistics like the OJJDP is going to have that. Cohort studies looking at frequencies over time, for example. But for when it comes to something like victimization reports, now here we can ask not only have we have you experienced this as a yes or no that we can then code as a zero or a one or a two or whatever it be we can ask them even bigger studies you know who was it that committed the crime have you experienced more crimes than that you know what do you attribute to the reason for that crime happening to you you know that that kind of stuff you know which is really sad you know, that people are victims of these crimes and that they're in situations where they're exposed to this kind of violence. And again, we have to understand, you know, what's going on in the social context that exposes people to becoming victims so that we can, one, prevent that kind of thing, you know. And so I, I put up uh, this chart from your book that talks about the different uh, crime reporting programs. Again, the FBI sponsors the crime reporting um, of arrest statistics, youth crime, uh, the National Crime Victimization Survey done by the Bureau of Justice and Statistics looks at victimization data. The number of victims discovered is much higher than the number of offenses reported to the police. Again, so even though we have this quantitative data, when we actually go out and ask people, we might find that there's 
significant differences between what we're actually arresting people for and how many crimes are actually being committed. So things like victimization reports, which will go beyond just a simple quantitative study, can get at some of these areas that you might not be able to get at, which is numbers. Looking at the juvenile court statistics, again, I uh, keep introducing the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the uh, OJJDP. Definitely check that out when you guys are going to do your projects. That's going to help you so much because they just have great stats and charts and executive reports. I'll show you a few of those in a second. And again, that's looking at those arrests and the delinquency cases processed in these courts. And then you have self-report surveys like universities, academic researchers, scholarly journals, going out and examining all kinds of phenomena associated with that. Okay, these are just a couple of topics. I put these up here. Oh, sorry. Um, as these are some of the things that like the OJJDP, for example, has great reports on. So here you have trends and characteristics of youth and residential placement. You know, what's going on? Is residential placement associated with an increased likelihood of juvenile crime, for example? Uh, bullying experiences reported by high school students, a victimization survey, going out and you know asking questions about that to find out what's going on. Trends and characteristics of delinquency cases handled by juvenile courts. What types of cases are they seeing? How many are being adjudicated? Why are they being arrested? What types of people are being arrested? What age specifically is most likely to be arrested? And again, we can go on for days answering all these questions, and that's why sociology is a broad field and that we're constantly studying stuff to try to make sense of reality in the social context. <laughs> and in order to do that, we need really good data. So how do we get the data? And then this is what we do with the data. We then take the data and we account for these research questions. Like, is a juvenile residential facility response to coronavirus pandemic associated with an increase or a decrease or nothing, no change, when it comes to juvenile rates, for example? Because what happens when all these kids get locked down in residential facilities? I actually need to read that one. I haven't read that. That sounds so fascinating. Um, and then just general highlights, for example. And then you also have in that uh, same website or the same .gov site, OJJDP, Things like just general population characteristics. How many people in general are considered juveniles? How many of them experience victimization? How many of them are uh, committing offenses? How are they being processed by the uh, juvenile justice system? What's going on with law enforcement arresting them? How often is that occurring? What type of interactions are they having? Uh, their juveniles experiences in courts, on probation, corrections, data for all of that. Again, we have data for how many kids right now, how many 0 to 17 or 0 to 18 are on probation or in the court system, being charged, working their way through the system, whatever it might be, okay? Uh, here is a good time to stop and talk about reliability and validity, which will come up always um, in all of your research methods classes and social science classes. How reliable and valid is this data? And again, even though we have all this great, consistent, reliable data when it comes to the OJJDP or, you know, any of the other crime statistic reporting, they don't have all of the crime data because not everybody gets arrested. So again, there's so much more crime that's not even being reported. So yes, this stuff is reliable and it's valid to the extent that it can account for how many crimes have been committed and arrested but it doesn't have the data to validly or accurately describe how many actual crimes are occurring. And again, that's why we need supplemental data like victimization studies to go out and ask people like, have you experienced crimes? For every hundred persons, how many of you have experienced some type of juvenile crime, for example, and then get at more specific data to even, you know, the, the, to support where we might be lacking. But whenever we're talking about reliability, it's Think about a scale. Does it consistently weigh a turkey the same time, the same way every single time? So if I weigh a turkey and it's 20 pounds, I weigh it the next time and it's 20 pounds, I weigh it the next time it's 20 pounds, it's reliable. If I put it on there and it's 20 pounds one time and 40 pounds the next time and 60 pounds the next time, it's not reliable. So again, you're asking, does it consistently measure the same thing over and over and over again? And when it comes to validity, you're looking at, is that actually accurate? Because even though the scale is uh, weighing out a turkey at 20 pounds, if I put that turkey on different scales, will they all measure 20 pounds? What if on my scale, 
it's 20 pounds, but then I do it with five other scales and they're all measuring it as 10 pounds. So even though it's consistent, it's invalid in that example for example. <laughs> uh, but again, reliability, consistency, validity is going to look at accuracy. Okay. All right, so juvenile court statistics. The Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which I obsessively keep talking about to put that into your head so that you guys will check that out to use that kind of data when you're going to prove points, is part of the U.S. Department of Justice, and, uh, and that's a great website. Again, I'm going to show you guys that. I'll just show it to you right now. I have it pulled up. So here's the website for the OJJDP. Um, I was looking up, this is the Office of Juvenile Justice here in Research and Statistics. If you click this, it has all of their evidence-based programs, um, archive data, statistics. Click that and fish around. I was looking at things like prevention guides. Like here's a bunch of just, um, what do you call these? There's an I word for it. Interventions. There we go. This is 350 interventions, approaches to how to reduce juvenile delinquency. And it's just fascinating. I want to check that out. So I had that on my website just to look that out. But look through here. It talks um, in research and statistics. I like to go in there. In my PowerPoint, I uh, brought in some executive summaries. So I generally try to look for things like executive summaries. Um, so on this page back here, for example, these are the executive summaries from the OJJDP. I brought it up a little bit later to talk about gender, race, and age and whether or not they're factors associated with uh, juvenile delinquency. But again, I got that data by looking through that website, looking through their executive reports, and pulling out the information from that. Um, so that is what that is that's a good resource for getting the data on some of the crime statistics for example related to juveniles um, the number of children appearing before juvenile court has increased since the 1960s until around 1995 and then it began to decline even though you might be hearing through the media and stuff that crime is up etc crime is way down so look at look at crime this is 1960s through the 1990s, it was pretty bad, but now look at it. We're back down to like where it was in the 1960s. So when you hear all the music in the 1990s talking about how rough the inner cities were and things like that, I'm not going to get into all why that occurred in this class. Take my sociology class for that. <coughs> but again, you can see that there has been a major shift in crime where juveniles are committing less crimes. Now the challenge for you is to ask why. Why is this number going down? And for me, my number one reason is I really think technology. I mean, I just, you know, we all got phones, we all got computers, and then people stopped hanging out as much. Drug use shows the same thing for juveniles. Um, having sex has gone down for juveniles. Um, so crime has gone down. I mean, so sex, drug use, crime, all has gone down since the 90s. Is it culture? Is it people's parenting styles or is it technology or is it an improved socioeconomic status? I mean, what accounts for this? And so that's the challenge, right? Is to account for this type of thing. Why is crime going down? That's the kind of stuff you guys should be thinking about, okay? Um, in 2019, the OJJDP released data on uh, 2017 delinquency cases showing that juvenile courts in the U.S. handled an estimated 818,900 delinquency cases, which was a significant decline from 19 years earlier. So again, since the 2000s, 1990s, even the, the juvenile, the number of juvenile case, uh, cases has gone down from, where was it, almost 2 million in 1995 to half, less than half, more than half of that, down to 818,000. Okay, so that's a pretty significant decrease um, over the last several decades. So again, why is that happening? 32% um, of these cases were property cases, 29 were personal offenses, 25 were public order offenses, and 13 were drug offenses, if you want to know how the crime stats are broken down. 
The largest presentance of violent offenses consisted of simple assault followed by aggravated assault and robberies. Larceny theft made up the largest number of property offenses followed by burglary and vandalism. And obstruction of justice and disorderly conduct comprised the largest percentages of public order offenses. And so again, if we need to pause this video and read through that, where am I getting these points though? I'm going to the research, right? They're gathering data, they're making up all these pretty charts, and then we as social scientists are interpreting this data and then asking questions to understand the social phenomena as why has crime gone down? Over here, I have a bunch of charts that, um, you know, this says it's still widespread, but is it compared to the 90s? You know what I mean? So again, whether 800,000 juvenile crimes or 728,000 juveniles under the 18 being arrested is a high number or a low number is arbitrary. It's us who decides what is a high number. Is anything over like any crime a high number or is the what 2 million from the 90s are a high number or is the 800,000 that we're seeing in modern times a high number? At what point do we draw the line? And again, that's for us to make our own, you know, decisions as to what's considered high crime and what's not. Um, but again, juvenile arrest rates for violent crimes such as robbery and aggravated assault have declined. Juveniles are arrested for serious property offenses as well as violent offenses. And again, you have a list of 12.4% are burglaries, 19.5% are robberies, 76 are murders, 69 are aggravated assaults. The purpose of going over all of this is just to show you that these numbers, these statistics can be broken down in any number of ways. We can look at violent offenses and how many of each type of violent offense there are. We can look at violent offenses compared to property crimes, compared to status offenses, compared to, you know, whatever it might be, drug use. And we can ask, you know, which crime is the most prevalent. We can look at these crimes for men and women and ask, is there a disparity? For races, is there a disparity? Male and juvenile, male and female juvenile arrest rates have declined in the last 10 years, and the relative declines have been greater for males than for females across many offenses. But why is it greater for males? It's because there's more males committing crimes. So, of course, if only 10% of crimes are female and you, they, that goes down to like 8% of crime, you know, then, you know... <laughs> And so again, that's the reasons for that. So again, how we interpret this data is also very important. We need to be thinking about that always also. So self-report studies are great. Um, some of the, uh, in order to do self-report studies, we as social scientists can go out and do interviews. We can build questionnaires. We can do surveys. We can do open-ended questions that can be qualitative surveys. We can do closed-ended uh, surveys that can be quantified into numerical data that we can then statistically interpret, for example. And there's a bunch of ways of going about this. Um, and so again, I'll put up my supplemental research methods lecture for you in case you're super interested in all the different types of experiments and quasi-experimental research and qualitative data like naturalistic observation, ethnography, phenomenology, all these ways of going out and getting data. But just some interesting facts that we've learned from self-report studies like your book had, just to show you the type of data we can get. By the time they were in the 10th or 11th grade, 54% of the Denver, Colorado juveniles and 58% of uh, the Rochester, New York youth reported that they have been involved in a violent crime at some time in their lives. So when we went out and we asked people, you know, did you ever commit a violent crime during these grades, for example, this is what people self-reported. 58% is going to be way higher than the number of people that were actually arrested, demonstrating that, you know, their crime is a lot higher than our arrest rates, for example. Uh, another example, chronic violent offenders constituting 14% of the sample in Denver and 15 in Rochester accounted for 82% of the violent offenses in Denver and 75 of the violent offenses in Rochester. So again, you have a small select few of violent offenders committing multiple violent offender crimes. And so again, just things that we could be looking at. So it's not so much the one-offs, it's the once somebody's actually done this once, are they more likely to do it twice? You know, and so it starts to look into those kinds of statistics. 
Victimization surveys, again, going out and past people. Have you ever been exposed to and experienced juvenile crime? Overall, the number of victimizations discovered was way higher than the number of offenses reported to the police. So again, you, uh, and then juveniles between the ages of 16 and 19 experienced the highest victimization rate of any age group for all crimes, and youths between ages 12 and 15 had the next highest rate. So when we go out and ask people at what age are you or what age did you experience these crimes, who is most likely to be a victim of crime that's a juvenile? And then this study found that people 16 and 19 are the most likely followed by 12 to 15. So you can see, like, you know, crime could be starting to go up, right? When you hit about 11, maybe age of puberty, start leaving the house, you start to see crime increase, and that increases all the way through high school, and then it seems to cap out. Okay, um, data also showed that adolescents are more likely than adults to commit violent crimes against peers and to report knowing their assailants, which is very interesting. Why are adolescents more likely to be violent toward their peers than adults? And this, again, I have to look at things like psychological reasons, like how much emotional intelligence or how emotionally developed are teenagers? Again, how developed is that prefrontal cortex? And then who are they interacting with at that time? If teenagers are more likely to be interacting with their peers, then that would that's the group that they're exposed to. So if it's going to happen in any arena, would it not most likely to be that, except for maybe domestic violence? Males are more likely than females to become victims of most violent crimes, but females are more likely to be victims of rape and sexual assault. So again, physical assault, males are more likely. Uh, sexual assault and sexual violence. Females are more likely. And this chart just shows the estimated violent victimization of juveniles over time. And even the self-reported -vic victimization studies are going down. So you can see here in the 1990s, this number 4 million is double what the actual number of crime statistics were, which was like 1.75 million. This is almost triple that number. Okay, and so as you can see, maybe, what, half of the crimes, less than half of crimes are actually being, that are committed are actually being arrested and adjudicated in the crimes. And then again, throughout this book, I'm not going to go too deep into it now. But again, as I talked about, we need to be thinking about all of the variables to account for why crime occurs. And then account for these patterns, these trends. Like, why are males more likely to commit crimes than females as juveniles? Why is crime going down so much over time? What variables are associated with this, okay? And so in this, we're going to look at things like gender, which we'll talk about in chapter six, looking at disparities between biological sexes um, or genders, depending on how we operationalize that. Because you have biological sex, which is chromosomes and uh, hormones and gonads and other factors like that. And then we have gender, which is a blend of biology influencing the categories that you identify with, and then the perception of which category you belong to, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But in this, they're generally looking at biological sex, even though gender is going to be kind of, they use gender here. But again, in social science, we need to be very particular about how we operationalize these definitions. So when we're talking this, I'm going to really try to refer to biological sex throughout most of this because I really feel like that's more what this is about um, when it comes to these crime statistics. I think biological sex is a more accurate heading, even though gender is being used in this. <laughs> but we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about social class and again, how we have some mixed data on whether Poverty, for example, is associated with crime. Race and ethnicity, and we're going to look at arrests. We're going to look at who is more likely to commit crimes. Is race after actually a factor, or is it more racism and poverty? And again, we'll delve into that in chapter 11 and 14. Uh, we're going to be looking at peers and the influence of peers and the social context, agents of socialization neighborhood and then more particularly we're going to be looking at the culture of the neighborhood socioeconomic status of the neighborhood 
But again, we have to ask questions. Why are there disparities between groups? Is it, you know, community disadvantage, like your book says, like the socioeconomic status of the culture of your neighborhood, for example, situational variables, like the, you know, what you're being exposed to in the social context, uh, hanging out with friends, wrong place, wrong time, deciding that you guys are going to go steal, whatever it might be. Gangs, we'll do a little work on that, even though gangs are not as pre prevalent as they were. In the 90s, it's still advantageous to discuss. And then just social bonds, you know, friends, family, other agents of socialization. But again, the real key here is to be asking, how are all these variables interconnected? You know, because again, there's not just one answer, like it's poverty, right? Or it's your parenting style, right? Or that kid's just messed up in the head, right? Because it's not that, that's not how it works. Like, you, and then you kind of get into like in psychology, you look at attribution errors, like, is it the social context to blame or is it the individual to blame or is it a little bit of both, you know? And so we have to ask what's going on. And that's why I like the biopsychosocial bio approach because people do have psychological distress that is associated with things like assault. I mean, think about it. People that are assaulting are angry and violent. That's a physical, biological and emotional response and a cognitive conscious response along with a lot of unconscious processes too. And so again, it's very complex. That's the beauty of it, okay? And so I'm gonna be pushing that this entire class. Um, really quick, so we can kind of, I just want to pull this up so we can look at it. So um, you guys can't see these numbers, but across two, well, I just need to zoom in. But across the board, you're just going to see negatives from 2005 to the modern times for males, females, people of different races, people of different ages. You're going to see that it's continuously going down for all of these people. And so I want to get a little bit, a little bit deeper. And we'll go delve deep into these statistics. But again, I'm just this chapter just wants to focus on here are the statistics. Here's some of the things that we can do with these numbers to prove points and look at factors. Here's the courts and trends. Again, the number of cases, this is in 2020. And if you look at 2005 to 2020 for all these different types of crimes, all of them are down. Look at that, 50, 60, 70%, even an 84% for liquor law violations. So I guess kids are not trying to buy alcohol right now. But again, homicide is the only one that is actually up. And so if all crime is going down, except for criminal homicide, why? And then we have to look at things like gun laws, access to guns. What's the number one way people commit the criminal homicide? Guns. So even though all other types of crime is down, the one thing that's up is homicide because why? Everybody's got guns. There's guns everywhere. The gun laws have been lowered. So again, you have to look at things like government, public policies and crime. That is stunning though. Me sitting here looking at that, like that is absolutely stunning. Gun crime increased 47% from 2016 to 2020. 47%. What happened? <laughs> Just things to be thinking about. All right, cool. So again, what can we do with these statistics? So length and intensity of juvenile offending. Another thing we can look at is looking at longitudinal studies of committing crimes across the lifespan and how a, being a juvenile delinquent or, a, or committing juvenile crimes is associated with not only long-term outcomes and measures of success, educational attainment, job prestige, wealth, things along those lines, but also whether or not somebody is committing multiple crimes over multiple years and the recidivism rate is just very high for them. So again, we look back to this developmental life course criminology theory, looking at crime across the life course from a biopsychosocial approach from zero all the way on and asking questions. Are there connections between experiences in youth, for example, and later decisions in life? 
So this is particularly concerned with documenting and explaining individual changes in offending across the life course, okay? So again, that lifespan perspective, looking at people, what's going on from beginning to end. This paradigm has greatly advanced knowledge about the measurement of criminal career features, such as age of onset, generally 10 to 12, uh, whether or not it persists, do these people that are persisting with their juvenile careers, is there an escalation of offenses or a specialization of offenses? Um, is there a tendency toward chronic offending and how long is their criminal career? And so the book discusses seven factors that distinguish the persisters or chronics from other convicted offenders. And my auto correct keeps wanting to change that because it looks like your book. I don't even know if that's like legal lingo. Persisters or chronics. That's how it's like, that's how it's literally phrased in the books. So I put it in there with some questions in my own brain. But again, that's looking at how likely are you to become a chronic offender, meaning that you're going to commit crimes multiple times. Okay, does that start in juvenile? Does it, you know, begin when you become an adult, for example? Is there an association between youth criminality and adult criminality? Um, so, but we're starting to find that some things that are associated with crime across the lifespan are being co convicted before age 13, uh, low family income, troublesome rating by teachers and peers at ages 8 to 10, poor school performance at age 10, psychomotor clumsiness. I don't think that's an accurate psychological term. Um, I would not say it like that, but again, this is just how your book is stating it, so I'm busting it out. Um, low nonverbal IQ and convicted sibling. Again, those peers, those ages of socialization that you're surrounded with. So again, we're looking at, is youth crime associated with adult criminality? And again, this is what can we do with all this data and this research? The experience of having been institutionalized as a juvenile seriously compromises multiple life domains in adulthood, especially for females, which is really interesting. Because even though males are more likely to commit crimes and be arrested, for example, the effect on institutionalization seems a little bit greater for females. And that's complex to answer why. But think about it. Research shows that institutionalization is strongly predictive of premature, unstable, precarious, and unsatisfied conditions in multiple life domains, but it's much less predictive of behavior outcomes. Um, prior participation has a genuine behavioral impact on the individual. Prior participation may, for example, reduce inhibitions against engaging in delinquent activity. Why does having done it before, you know, reduce these inhibitions? Is it because they become desensitized to it once you get used to that culture of committing crimes, going to jail, working your way through the system? Do you get used to that culture, that way of life? And so again, it's complex. Do they just lose hope? Do they just not have the skills to get an education to go get a job? Do they not have the desire to go get a job? They do not have the opportunities to get a job. Were they never invested in in the first place by society? Were they left in the gutter and nobody cared about them? Did they have parents that abused them? It's so complex, okay, to account for this. But again, that's the goal, right? How is committing crimes as a youth associated with going further and committing it as an adult? So again, the structural context mediated by an informal family and school social control explains delinquency in childhood and adolescence. That, I don't know if it's an accurate statement, but this is from your book, but it's basically saying that the social context is associated with it, including the family that you were raised in, the neighborhood you were raised in, the people that you're exposed to, the ideologies that you're exposed to, but that's insufficient. You also need more psychological because again, is just growing up in a bad neighborhood justification for being a criminal? And so again, it's, it's more complex than that. Why does someone choose to commit crimes when they're in poverty instead of, you know what, I'm just going to go get two jobs. I'm going to work McDonald's in the morning and Wendy's at the night, 80 hours a week for a couple weeks get myself a better apartment in a nicer neighborhood, and then I'm going to do that a couple more weeks. I'm going to get myself a car, and then a couple more weeks, I'm going to go to school. Or is that just too easy, you know, and for me to just rant off? Like, it's maybe 
just it's not that easy to go get that job and to get that money and to save and to get your way out of poverty. Maybe it's more difficult than that. And so again, that's why I like the qualitative data. Let's go find out. Well, why are you still committing crimes? I get it. Like, you know, like the statistics are saying they are still committing crimes, but it's not telling me why. I almost need to go out and ask people, why are you committing more crimes? And then have an interview with them and then code that information for common themes and then better explain the statistics, you know? So again, you need both that quantitative and qualitative data to really look at this too. And then they'll especially look at psychological factors. Like we have to get into somebody's head. We got to ask them questions. We got to find out what's going on in their mind. How better to do that than to interview people and ask them questions and then to find the common themes. Um, in turn, there's a continuity in antisocial behavior from childhood through adulthood in a variety of life domains. So again, antisocial behavior being labeled as engaging in behavior that's labeled deviant by society. And again, that's totally dependent upon the culture that is doing the judging, for example. Because again, if you're hanging out with a bunch of criminals and they're all committing crimes and you're committing crimes to them, that's not antisocial behavior at all. It's just completely the norm. If you hang out with a bunch of people that smoke weed and they all smoke weed, they're going to think it's the norm. If you hang out with a bunch of people that don't smoke weed and then somebody starts smoking some weed in front of them, they're going to be like, that's antisocial behavior. So again, it's all dependent upon the cultures that you're exposed to. Informal social bonds uh, to work and family and adulthood explain changes in criminality over the lifespan despite early childhood propensities. So again, these connections to our peers, the people we hang around with, there's going to be a lot of talk about that in this class, for sure. <laughs> That'll come up later. Uh, for prevention and control of delinquency, again, just think about methods that we can apply to reduce crime. Is it a cultural shift, right? Maybe we as this culture need to push value systems and ideologies that are anti-crime in such a way that we do it better than we are now. Um, is it something like reducing poverty? Is it something like increasing access to education? Is it increasing access to jobs? Is it, you know, helping people develop better parenting skills so that they know how to raise their kids, for example? The book states in their words that there was an epidemic of youth violence that peaked in the 80s and 90s, and homicide rates tripled during this time due to access with guns. Then we had some gun prevention laws put into place and it went down. And then again, in about 2016, you're starting to see the rise in guns again. And now you're starting to see the homicide rates going up, even though all of their crimes going down. But again, what would you have done to prevent violence? Is it let's get the guns out of their hand? Is it let's get rid of the drugs? Or is it let's educate them? Let's tell them what's out in the world. Guys, weed exists. Cocaine exists. LSD exists. These are the effects of taking these drugs. You take cocaine, you will have holes in your brain. I have seen, man, you, have you ever seen the MRI pictures of cocaine users? I saw that when I was a kid. And that did prevent me from doing cocaine. Not that I want to do cocaine, but I never got the image of the dang holes on in the MRI out of my head. I was like, oh my God, ecstasy can do that. Cocaine can do that. It can eat holes in your brain, but it does. It's crazy. So again, you know, how do you best prevent it? So the book talks about alternative sanctions and interventions to help young gun offenders go straight. What can we do when someone gets offended, you know, is a gun criminal? Good communication between community and the police. Is your grandma calling the police the best way to prevent crimes? It has a big effect. Community mobilization strategy to encourage youth and residents to work together to improve the community. Again, how can we build it up? The socioeconomic status, the environment, the culture of the neighborhood. Public information programs using mass media to communicate the dangers of violence and committing crimes. Programs to teach at-risk youth how to resolve conflict instead of picking up a gun. Positive opportunities for young people, including tutoring, mentoring, job training, after-school activities. Special law enforcement units targeting illegal gun trafficking and gang-related gun crime. Again, these are all the strategies for reducing juvenile gun violence, as this chart over here says, but... You know, what would you do for all the other types of crimes? I mean, that's kind of the goal, right? And so, again, I pulled up that website that there's 350 different options of things we can implement to have some kind of an effect on reducing crime. So, again, the main purpose of this chapter was just to delve into all the different types of data that we can gather. What can we use that data for? 
but then the overall goal, right, would be to apply that data. So whenever you're looking at data or research methods, you always have basic and applied research. Basic, just gaining knowledge for the sake of knowledge, and then applied, taking that knowledge and doing something with it. What can we do to reduce crime? As you see, crime is already going down completely, but is there something else that we could do to have a bigger effect? Thank you all so much, and have a wonderful day.